this week on Forward. The truth is, whoever has the power is the person is is the entity that gets to take your speech or control your speech. And if we're not aligned with principles, if we don't stand by these principles, no matter who has the power, then you know we lose that. And you are expressing what the silenced majority truly is thinking and feeling. You know, the reason I wrote this book is I really wanted to empower the silent majority. I think most people are actually sensible, but it takes, you know, a few really radical voices to set the narrative of our world and our society. It is my pleasure to welcome to the podcast commentator and author of the brand new book, No Apologies, How to Find and Free Your Voice in the Age of Outrage, Catherine Brodsky. Welcome, Catherine. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Oh, I've admired your work for quite some time, and congratulations on the book. I enjoyed it a great deal. Your backstory, painful in the sense you're like, oh, no, that happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the painful part, indeed. Yeah, so uh, how did you get into writing and media? Oh, well, I mean, originally, I just always was a very curious person. And I thought that the best way to satisfy my curiosity was to interview interesting people. But how do you get it? access to interesting people without being a stalker. Well, you know, saying that I'm a journalist. So I actually, you probably don't know this part, but I actually started an online magazine uh, when I was really young. Like I might've been still, I was still a teenager when I did that. And it, I grew it to about 600,000 um, monthly sounds so, visitors. Yeah. That sounds so significant. What was it called? And was it for teens? <laughs> It wasn't. It was just an entertainment and culture magazine. And we used to have somebody gave me the name, like they handed the website to me. So I just kind of made it. Uh, but it was called Moda Mag. And it was, you know, because of the name, at first I had like fashion models on the cover. And then, you know, gradually I phased out of that because actually that was not an interest of mine. But you know, the first opportunities in journalism I, I had actually through that. And I really, I don't even think I, I think at the time I was intended to become this like, you know, entrepreneur and capitalist, but instead, you know, I, I coded the website terribly, mind you. And I also, I would also say like the first, my very first article that I published was for a print publication. And I was like 15 years old back then. And I was paid $50. And I thought, Wow, that's a fortune. You know how long I'd have to work in retail to make that much? And then, you know, you learn <laughs> the better that maybe $50 is not quite exciting. But for a teenager, it, it's, it's, it's a fortune. And uh, where did you grow up, Catherine? So I started my whole journey in the Soviet Union. So I was born in the Ukraine part of the Soviet Union. And so it was still the communist regime back then. And I was quite young when we left, but I did indeed um, live there for a bit and you know, sort of grew up with the stories of my of my parents. And then we, we were meant to go to the U.S., actually, but ended up having a bit of a detour due to uh, something to do with a bribery. Um, so we ended up anyways... Um, our spot was kind of taken. And so we ended up going through Israel. And so I lived in Israel for about six years as well. Just it's smack in the middle of the Gulf War. So it's just great timing. And then from there, I ended up in Canada and I lived in Canada and New York. Yeah. So the the story and the book picks up when you're a thriving media professional in New York City. And I have to say, there's something very romantic about wanting to work in media or as a creative and moving to New York City and then making it happen, um, which you did. And you wrote for some very big publications. On the side, you started a job board for women in media, which everyone loved on you for. Uh, you got actually media mentions for running this job board. And then a number of years in, someone posted a job listing for Fox News, and this uproar ensued. And then you, as the moderator of this job board, said, hey, guys, it's fine. It's a job in media for women. That's kind of what we exist for. And what happened next? Well, because people, you know, assume that Fox, because it's Fox, they, you know, it's the worst, most evil news media organization in the world. And, and they were really, really upset with the woman who posted the job opportunity. 
And I thought, like you said, you know, I'm like, okay, well, this is, <laughs> this is not right. We, this is very, um, you know, let's stay away from politics and let's not, you know, personally attack other people. They didn't like that very much. So I started getting called a white supremacist. They said that I'd had soon let the KKK recruit from my job board and all sorts of things that I, I have to say, I didn't see that coming at the time. I did not see that coming. And then further, they said, well, you know, you can't take the political out of, of the, out of the group because it's a group that's inherently for women. So then I said, well, I'll open it up to everyone then because I don't want any politics in here. <laughs> and uh, that really, I think that really escalated things quite a bit. And that's where it got to the point of beyond just calling me names, I started getting DMs. I had people reach out to editors of mine to try to get me, you know, quote unquote, canceled so that I'd never work again. They said, we have very long memories. I got images, I, I, I got a DMs with images of mobs with torches, attempted dock. I went to panels and people would start attacking me during these live panels and just just downvoting all my content and all of that stuff. And, and it's just it was it was a lot. I didn't expect that at all. Uh, yeah. Who would? You know, you're the benign <laughs> moderator of a job board that everyone was using and loving on. And then you, 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 you were just uh, saying, look, frankly, like, like our purpose is to help women find jobs in media. And, uh, you know, if you don't want to apply to that job, then please don't. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and who am I to say, okay, well, Fox, you can't apply to, you can't work. Well, where do I go? Well, maybe I don't like MSNBC. I'm just picking it randomly, right? Sure. Or BBC or whatever, right? What if I really hate those, uh, the values of those organizations? Do I then say you can't apply for that job and it's acceptable now to attack people for posting those jobs? So where does the line get drawn and who decides? So for me, the idea of like, okay, I'm this arbitrator of like where somebody can and cannot work. And you're right. You know, maybe you go work at a media organization and you make it better, which by the way, the, the original poster, she did post it in this sort of apologetic way, but she did mention, you know, we want to diversify our newsroom. We want to make some changes. So even her intention was there, but that, that shouldn't even matter. I mean, ultimately why is it up to me to decide who applies to what? People have all sorts of reasons. And again, I might really hate some publications that they love. Do I then decide, well, that's not an acceptable place? So you were very honest about your experience where you were surprised. Uh, it was painful. There were a bunch of people that you would have expected to have defended you. And, uh, you know, there wasn't a peep um, because it turns out that uh, folks in that industry in particular are very fearful of having uh, work denied to them. And so there's like this uh, cascading lemming uh, effect. Um, you did do something very courageous, um, which is you wrote a story about it uh, in, in Newsweek. And uh, that was a very uncertain move. I think there were people in your life who were urging you not to do it. <laughs> but, 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 yes. you, but it was... It was about the rise of online bullying. Um, and happily, that article was well received. It really was. And it's true. I mean, at the time, I thought, man, am I, I'm going to destroy everything. I mean, my career at the time was like at its peak. I was writing for all these really big publications. I was getting into some other genres that I wanted. I was working on movies and shows. So everything was going, you know, quite swimmingly, as they say. And I thought, I genuinely did think that everything will be destroyed because now I'm, you know, it's starting to die out and now I'm going to cause even more of a wave and more attention. And now I'm really going out on the offensive in a way, right? Because I'm calling out these bullies, these tactics. So I, I did think my, my career would be certainly destroyed and my life, but I thought, you know, I, I, because I was getting so many messages from other people where they were feeling voiceless, they were so afraid and ashamed of not being able to speak. And then on top of it, you know, all these people sharing their own stories with me, uh, people who just never made it out of this. I felt a certain responsibility to use my voice, whatever voice I had and speak out, you know, just it, the great injustice, injustice of it just didn't feel right to me. But two things happened. One, sort of the bullies stopped because I called them what they are. And if they had continued, I think that would have made it even more obvious what they were. 
And two, a lot of people started also reaching out to me because they're affected by the article that they read. And some people were just, you know, trying to be allies, you know, to use that word. And other people were just, you know, saying, this is how I feel. And I am also really afraid of expressing it. Hey YouTube, thanks for watching. Please do hit like and subscribe and hit that bell if you want to be notified every time a new episode drops. Probably on Mondays, but hit that bell and thank you. Yeah, and that's really what your book's about is for people in a similar boat, people trying to figure out uh, how can I say what I actually think without uh, fear of being canceled. Uh, and so you have a bunch of lessons and stories, uh, in many cases, from people who've gone through similar things uh, to, to you. Um, so some of the lessons are to build your own tribe. You talk about a plan B. And I'm going to speak for a minute on this just because, you know, it may be interesting. I feel yes. really, really bad for the folks who make a living in media and content and, and as creatives because there's this constant fear of being canceled. And then where is your job? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like if people don't want to click on your stuff. And so the way to insulate yourself from that in an ideal world, and this is not easy to do, so, you know, uh, and I, I've lived versions of this, is to get a bunch of super fans who will be with you no matter what and give you five to 10 bucks a month. And you get enough of them, you're like, okay, I'm not going to get rich on this, but I'll at least be able to be independent um, if these people are willing to support me. And I, I think that has been a way out for some people. Um, but I feel terrible for folks who are in this space who feel like their livelihood is dependent upon them towing the party line. Uh, and I'm very, very grateful for um, my situation personally, where, like, you know, I've, I've probably uh, touched uh, the third rail a, a time or two, but, you know, I'm fine. <laughs> well, I think that's the benefit of being an, an entrepreneur versus an employee. And that's that's going to be true regardless if it's in media or if it's in something else. With media, the difficulty is that, you know, you are if, if you're somebody who's an outsider in a way and how you think, it makes it much more difficult to fit into these spaces. And then of course, once you transgress and go too far outside the line, yeah, you, you, you can lose everything. People are afraid, even if they don't mind what you said, it's like, they don't want to be, they're afraid of being associated because oh, and, and I, that's I a call big it faux outrage, Catherine. Cause it's like that, yeah. you know, you're looking at it being like, who's actually upset about <laughs> Almost no way. I mean, when I've told the story to people in my life and people who are like very, very like progressive or left or whatever, if you want to politicize it, I mean, like none of them thought this was in any way a sane situation uh, because they're not insane people and they're not bullies, the people that I choose to surround myself with. So it was it was just a very weird thing. And it's very much a social media phenomenon to an extent as well. But for me, I, uh, you know, in terms of the financial side of it, it's it's a really big issue. And I've thought about this a lot myself. You know, some people advocate for not being able to have laws where you can't fire somebody, for example, for things that they say outside of work hours. And I'm mixed on that, to be to be perfectly frank, because in a way I understand that and, and it seems like a good intention there. And on the other hand, I, I also value a free association. So, you know, do I really want to pay money to someone who is <laughs> really, really awful? So I don't know. And honestly, I don't have a great solution to that because because it's um, I think it's a complex thing. And I haven't figured that one out uh, where the balance is between the sort of personal rights and the rights of another individual to their speech. But in terms of your own, you know, I, I want to encourage society to just be a lot more forgiving and open. And that's where I'm, I'm sort of heading in, the, in that direction as opposed to just saying, well, you have to associate with people whose views you find completely abhorrent, you know. I think sometimes there is a benefit to that. And, and there is at least one story in the book about someone who does engage with people who are, you know, it's Daryl Davis and he engages with the KKK, right, with members of the KKK. And some of them ended up leaving that group as a result of those engagements. So there is benefits to it. But at the same time, you know, uh, 
I don't want to force anybody to talk to people they don't want to. It's just I want people to be more open minded. And I want to encourage that not have this outrage and have an opportunity for people to explain themselves and have an opportunity to have discourse and change their mind. But in terms of the financial side of it, you know, it is really difficult to protect yourself. And what you said is accurate. Yes, you can, you know, you can start your own sub stack or, or something like that, or your own blog and or YouTube channel and have super fans. And this is something that people had encouraged me to do. I really struggled with the idea of, of, you know, soliciting money in any way. That was a very uncomfortable thing for me. But at the same time, I was writing a lot of content and I thought, okay, well, if people want it to, to support me, I guess they should be able to. But one of the problems that I see in that dynamic is also a lot of times the people who do best with that were people who go more no, for the outrageous as content. As an extra grind. It's like if you an, an extra, extra grind, more yeah. sensationalist or or really lean into something like, say, political, somebody, you know, maybe yeah. they support a political candidate. And, and I didn't want to do that. So it puts people like me in a much more, I think, difficult category because oh, well, I don't welcome have to that. my world, Catherine, too. And this <laughs> yes. is one of the, the, the dangers of the two party system, in my opinion. So I left the Democratic Party because, uh, you know, I think the two party system is busted and you know we have to try and find something better. Um, and, and then I, I can't tell you, I had dozens and dozens of press requests from Fox who just wanted me to come on and, and trash talk the Democrats. Yeah. And I'm like, look, and also, by the way, legions of Democrats being like, oh, he's going to, uh, you know, become a Republican in like a, a month or whatever. And I looked at this and I was like, like, no. And when I went on Fox, I will say, I was like, like, look, guys, I'm not going to just be your like, you know, uh, guy who like punches uh, the Democrats uh, all day long. I think I did like one or two and then start, start, stopped saying yes. That There's like this unfortunate dynamic where uh, combat sells and there are only two teams and you're only allowed to be on one team um, and beat up the other if you want that media energy or that social media energy. Yeah. And then there are those of us who are like, wait a minute, I got, I'm not about your team or the other team. Uh, you know, it's like I want good things for people. Um, I think there are real excesses in American life in, in various ways. Certainly in this cancel culture you're describing, I mean, your story, people are like, what, that happened? It's like, yeah, they, it kind of did. Um, you have another story of a guy, uh, Stephen Elliott. It's like, holy crap. Like this this guy was accused of, of uh, being a sexual assaulter, harasser in uh, the Me Too era. And he's, oh, I think he's accused of, uh, you know, something. Of rape. Yeah, of rape, of very, something very <laughs> yeah. aggressive. And, and he's, gay or like what like and he was like oh this is clearly not right because and anyone who knows me knows like i actually don't have sex with women so uh, you know no problem <laughs> and then it's still well because he's been and i think that's about. what made his story sort of um unique in a way where he you know a lot of times when men were accused under the me too side of things you know there was this feeling of like, oh, maybe there's a misinterpretation, right? It's it's like maybe maybe she th she wasn't really into it or so they sort of look back and reflect. But in his case, so he's he knew because he did, doesn't have penetrative sex with women and he wrote about that and uh, quite extensively because he used to be a sex worker. And so it was it was very in the open. He was very open about that for a very long time. So people who knew him absolutely knew that that was not a possibility. He even was Won a, well, he even won a defamation suit later, which is like a very high standard. So, you know, it was false. I mean, like he, he but that is years later after his. Yeah, it was it was, was settled, but because it, it would have dragged out forever if uh, but it, in his favor. And that's actually what's interesting in his story is that that's what made people the angriest, that he would fight this, that he didn't just say, you know, OK, let, let's let it go. Uh, let's move on. But he actually fought it. And that well, made people it, it angry because it went to let it go, because he, he was he, his career got uh submarined a, as a result and one of the oh, things completely you, and one of the things you said too which i really appreciate is honest is like some client didn't hire you for something that you were a perfect fit for and then you thought it was a, it's like is it because of like that social media cancellation nonsense and it kind of like creeps into your head you're like did like, like did that happen it does it plays with your head because i very much you know and especially even i mean for sure now but not just the, and originally it was the cancellation, right? Because there were definitely, there were some people writing articles, there was things being spread around. So I didn't know, 
how much of an impact that had. And then later on, I had a situation, you know, I, for example, I had a client that loved me, like kept hiring me over and over again, absolutely saying my praises, nothing bad happened, everything always went smoothly. And then for some reason, they didn't call me again. That was odd. Um, and I don't know. And I know that I also have um, a footprint now. And part of that, you know, I have chosen that. So I have to take that, uh, you know, responsibility on myself, right? Because I didn't hide from this. And I decided to fight this and speak up. So if you search up my name, a whole bunch of my thoughts come out about all sorts of topics. And some people might find them agreeable or disagreeable. It's, it's weird how free speech has become code for right Wing, which I don't understand because I grew up with that as it being used to be like, left wing. <laughs> completely left wing. It was we were actually told in school that it was the right wingers who wanted to take our speech away. And now the people on the right are like the left wingers are trying to take your speech away. And I think the, the truth is whoever has the power is the person is is the entity that gets to take your speech or control your speech. And if we're not aligned with principles, if we don't stand by these principles, no matter who has the power then, you know, we lose that and we lose that incredible thing, uh, which is, you know, much more protected in the U.S. because you have the First Amendment, um, not as protected in Canada, but still somewhat protected. And, and, and in various countries is very much under attack. And it's it's terrifying, actually, how much under attack it is. And we take a lot for granted because in many countries, for example, where I came from, the Soviet Union, speech was definitely not free. Um, in China and in many countries around the world, people can be killed. It's a matter of life and death. And sometimes you say the wrong thing about use. the dictator and then you disappear. You know, I mean, not like yeah, that, exactly. Crazy. So I think this we take it for granted in the West is and this is something that I took for granted. Right. Because I grew up in the West and I thought the West is great. This can never go astray. The speech can't be taken away. Our rights are always ours. And my parents were saying, hey, there's like echoes here of communist Soviet Union. And I thought, man, they're paranoid Eastern Europeans. And I owe them very much an apology because I started understanding at a certain point that they are correct. And it yeah. can just turn. I mean, it turned in Ger Germany was a very uh, democratic society, very free. That was the place to be. And then it wasn't. So this idea that it can it takes a long time, it can't happen here. Oh, it's just a little violation on your rights. That's not true. This podcast is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is a little like walking your dog in public without a leash. Most of the time it might work out, but then that one time your dog could run away or get dog napped, it's better to take a little bit of care, especially when it's as simple as using ExpressVPN. When I log on to the internet, I just click on ExpressVPN and I get beamed on through an encrypted network, through a server someplace. I have no idea where it is, but then no one else does either. It's great. They can't track you, they can't buy and sell your data, you know it's secure, and you can get content from other parts of the world, so you can be kind of international and cosmopolitan. If that sounds good to you, right now you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN free at expressvpn.com slash yang. That's expressvpn.com slash yang, expressvpn.com slash yang. Yeah, there's a quote from Stephen Elliott in the book that uh, really spoke to me. It said, people who want to be good can do awful things uh, in the name of being good, you know? Yeah. And, and that there's like this very destructive morality that somehow I'm doing the right thing by canceling this stranger. Uh, and meanwhile, there's a human being on the other end of that who's like, wait, what's going on? I, I mean, your story and Stephen's story and other people too, where you look at it, because one of the things that happens when there's this cancellation wave uh, and I'd say there are three types. One is like, oh, like that that person clearly is guilty. And uh, like maybe it hasn't happened to court of law, but I'm pretty confident, you know, Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein, people like that, <laughs> you're, you're, you're like very, very glad that. The, I the, mean, the, they both went to court. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, eventually they both went to court and we're very guilty. And they're just like, oh, it's fine. But even before they were to court, we're like, I'm pretty confident on that one. <laughs> you know, 
Uh, that, that, I that struggle means- with that idea, by the way, because, um, you know, for example, Kevin Spacey, you know, he was acquitted three times, right? Because there were three trials, one in New York. In the New York trial, he was found not guilty. There was another one where the charges were dropped because the, the witness last minute decided not to testify. And then the third one in the UK where he was found not guilty. In the minds of the public, he is guilty, and it's hard to get over that because, look, courts don't always find, you know, there's there's complications that arise, right? The the burden of proof. The, and so even when somebody is acquitted in court, in the Often court the of public opinion. Done, and and, that, and that, that's really so I, I and this is in your book, too. Like, I generally agree with the principle. Uh, just assume everyone's innocent until they're proven guilty. And that's codified in the, uh, the American legal system where it's like, you know, presumption of innocence. Um, it is problematic. You're right. That sometimes, uh, you know, people like me, you know, just look at it and be like, Oh, that, that dude definitely. <laughs> you know, you know, no, like it's that, human like, nature. Like, I do this too. Right. It's yeah, yeah, not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, then there's like the, the multitude of gray area cases. Um, and, and then there are the cases where it's like, Oh, that's, that's completely messed up. And that person um, either, uh, did nothing wrong in the case of it sounds like Stephen Elliott, um, or, or in your case where it was like completely innocuous, and you're like, hey, I mean, your story would get someone riled up because it's one of those stories of no good deed goes unpunished. It's like, let me get this straight. I run a job board for women of my, the, <laughs> my, my jobs in media. I'm doing it as a volunteer. Uh, you know, people like it. It's like happy, and then I'm getting pilloried for what? Like, le- like letting someone, you know, post a job that some people. Um, uh, oppose on, um, you know, political grounds. Um, yeah. So, so there, there's like the, this, and and what happens to most people, unfortunately, is they look at this and just say, like, just keep me out of it. Glad it's not me. <laughs> and as, and, you know, a hundred percent. That's yeah, what most like, people they, do. They have like different opinions. Um, now, I, I agree with your standards of like, look, le- like first, let's be more open and forgiving. Um, and less judgmental. I certainly think that the online cancel uh, dynamic is very, very problematic because there's like a bloodthirstiness and pettiness. And it's like, hey, let's destroy this person who, again, is a human being on the other end of it. Um, but like we're, we're just going to essentially dehumanize them for the purpose of this and attack them and try and destroy their career. And then we're going to forget about it two months, three months later. And then like some places that person's career is still destroyed if they work in a lot of fields, uh, you know, I, I think of the most unforgiving fields in this particular domain, I'd say media and academia are like very, very high on the list. And because very of that, so. and because of that, people in those environments are the most afraid. And it's weird too, because those should be the most free environments, right? You should be able to say stupid things and explore ideas and, and stumble. And you should be able to, to, you really examine things, whether in academia, but also in media, you should be able to have the difficult conversations, but it's become so, and I was noticing that for very long, long before I was already quite critical of the me- media landscape. Cause I was noticing this consensus culture that I also talk about in terms of science, but this idea, like you can't look at a story in a different perspective. You have to use this kind of language and it's nobody tells you you have to write a story this way. I think people is, who aren't in media, they sort of assume that you get marching orders. and That doesn't happen. It's more so that you know that if you cross the line in a certain way, your story is not going to be accepted, right? It's, it's modeling. And then you know that you have to use certain language and sort of inclusive language. And, and so you are ultimately... You know, it's it's the tribe, it's the culture, and you have to fit in the culture. And it's just the same thing, like with the bullies, right? They go they go at you because you somehow went outside of their consensus, their group, and that to them is very upsetting. It's one thing for me to say, "Hey, you deny, I don't know, you deny the Holocaust." Eh, you know, maybe I want to talk to you about it, but maybe not. Maybe you you know, and and maybe your breath stinks, and I don't like to be so close to you. Whatever it is, right, that you feel like you don't want to associate with a person, but it's a completely different thing for a whole big group of people to decide. Well, we don't agree with this point here, and we're going to go and we're going to destroy this person's life, and and it's a mob, and it's and it's it's a power. And somebody said to me in, in an interview, and I thought that I reflected on that because I thought it was a really good point. What is the point of this mob's behavior? 
um, to cancel you. What is the the ultimate um, outcome of that? Okay, so you lose your job. Okay, you lose your job. What do you do? How do you feed yourself? So ultimately, it's almost like they're trying to kill you <laughs> in a way. They might not be thinking it through that way. I don't think they are. Well, well there but was that's one what case happens. Where, where an academic um, took his own life. And then yeah. there wasn't exactly like, uh, oh, wow, like, you know, we went too far. I mean, there, there were some people um, that were more like uh, serves them right. I mean, you know, again. A lot of people. Yeah, there's like a bloodthirstiness again to this that is very, very dehumanizing. Well, and the behavior is dehumanizing, right? It's not just people saying, listen, I disagree with what you said because A, B, and C. And this is what I do, by the way, when I disagree with someone, and I often disagree with people, but um, but what they do is like, no, let's call you names. Let's dehumanize you. Let's do bad things to you. That's not the behavior of anybody who's just disagreeing. Well, I think you were called a white supremacist, and that's one of like the dehumanizing labels where it's like, well, now that yeah. I've slapped this on you then we don't have to listen to anything you say because who wants to listen to a white supremacist? Yeah, absolutely. And it's such a ridiculous one because, um, you know, white supremacists kind of hate me for obvious reasons, um, being Jewish and all. However, it shouldn't even matter what I am or not. Like, you cannot just stick a label to someone over something like this. And and people do it all the time. And and they do it because people care about these labels, including me. Look, like somebody like me doesn't want to be called a racist or or all these things because, it's, you know, I don't want to be a racist. Right. And that's the person that they're hurting. Right. They're not hurting people who are like, yeah, I'm a racist and proud of it. Oh, this which, is by one the, way, of the entire like no good deed goes unpunished thing. It's like they can only hurt you if you're close enough to like, uh, you know, the, the particular tribe and whatnot for it all to hurt. Uh, but one of the problems is that it ends up pushing people into the other corner. And then it's like, wait, whoever's attacking me, fuck you. I'm now on the opposite of whatever, you know, whatever, whatever side you're, you're on, which again, that happens a a lot. Thing. It, it does. I mean, I, I really appreciate people who get attacked and then still have like a greater humanity about it. This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. We sleep more than we do just about anything else. Even if you're hardworking, you know what I mean. Why sleep on a mattress that's made for lots of people when you can sleep on a mattress that's personalized to you? Just take the quiz at Helix Sleep and get a mattress sent to you that has a 100-night trial, yup, three months, and a 10- to 15-year warranty. My kids seek out the Helix mattress in the house. It's their favorite one, and I gotta say, it wasn't made for them. It was made for me. Don't want to take my word for it. Helix has been awarded the number one mattress picked by GQ and Wired Magazine. It's going to make you healthier and more energetic. Do something that's actually going to improve your health. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang and use code helixpartner20. This is their best offer yet and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. You know, and, and, and you're talking about the scarring, like I appreciate it because you're like, well, it looks like guys, this was not positive And like, you know, I'm still, <laughs> you know. Yeah, like, I want I, people to know and I want people to not think that I'm some sort of a brave person. I'm like one of the most vulnerable, emotional. I remember I said this on a podcast my mom was listening to and she was kind of worried for me. Why are you saying this? This is going to cause people to go after you more. And I said, well, you know, I think that it's important for people to understand that because they need to recognize that in themselves. Because I'm not, you know, maybe I come across like I'm like super uh, confident about this stuff now. First of all, I went through a period where I was deeply uncomfortable, deeply emotional. It was quite traumatizing an experience. I am somebody who wants to get along with people. So the idea that this Most whole mob of people- Most people want people to like them. Most people want people to do. like them. And then when there's a lot of vitriol and hatred and energy channeled towards your way, it is very, very- difficult. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I don't think most people understand what it's like to be on the receiving end of, of this. I mean, you, you have to be essentially inhuman for it not to affect you. 
Yeah, no, exactly. And, and for me, I, as somebody who's, you know, I, I just wrote about, I started thinking more about bullying in the last little while as the book was coming out because, you know, I do have a past uh, in high school, you know, and, and, be, and before that where I was quite heavily bullied. And so, you know, I think it causes you to go into that same place and feel the same emotions um, because you never fully get over it. I mean, and it's it's interesting to me because I see a lot of people who become bullies themselves after they've been bullied. And it never sure. made sense to me because it should be the opposite. You know, you understand what it feels like and you should try to help people out. And and part of why, you know, I wouldn't want to be the kind of person who stands up for other people is because, well, not a lot of people stood up for me then, too. And that's a that's a big parallel, too, because I remember I my mind went back to this incident where you know, I, I, I had a, some, I'm, I'm all, it's embarrassing to even say, you know, that, that, that particular bullying incident, it, it was physical as well. So, and I had friends next to me at the time and my friends remained completely quiet and kind of went and stood in the corner. And then later on, they said to me, you know, I'm so sorry. I feel bad, but I felt, we felt scared and we didn't help you. And there was two people you know, on the bully side, and there were two friends on my side. And do you think the bullies would have continued if my friend stood up? I don't think so. And so, but that's what happens. It happens in school. It happens in high school. It happens in middle school. And it also happens with adults. Like the adults never really grow up. They just find other justifications for sharpening their teeth. They, you know, instead of, hey, you're a weird kid, uh, or whatever it is that they're thinking, or you're not giving us the candy we just asked you for. It's it's more about okay, this is we're righteous, you know. We have the moral the moral right on our side, you know. And you are you're bad. You're a white supremacist, you know. You're not a not kid anymore. You're just a white supremacist. So your life does, you know. We can do whatever we want to you. And ultimately, it all comes down to dehumanization. To feel better about yourself, I guess. Yeah. Hurt people, hurt people. Um, you know, one of the things I hate that phrase. (laughs) Do you? Well, I hate that phrase because I don't think hurt people should be hurting other people. I understand that it's true in many cases, but, but that's fundamentally to me, it's unsettling because again, if you get hurt, you should know better. You should be the number one person for trying to make sure that you should have empathy for other people. And the fact that people don't, it's really sad to me. And my dad told me this story, you know, in the military, when they recruit and they do these hazings, right? In the, in the first week when you have new recruits, they go through some really terrible things. Then he was in the, you know, the Soviet army, I guess, training side of things. Um, so it was not pretty. And then the recruit, the, those people who went through that hazing, they can't wait for the new recruit. They can't wait to, to haze somebody. In. Yeah, totally. Exactly. And like, to me, that psychology of that is, is just, I don't know. Well, you know, it's, I mean, you talk about how uh, people who are bullied, uh, bully them, bully others. I mean, I, I think that that is uh, a lot of what we are experiencing. I've got a, a question. One of the themes I noticed when I was re- reading these narratives was that a lot of them seem to either be in Canada or move to Canada. I think you might be, have moved to Canada. Is Canada better? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if uh, I don't know if a lot of them moved to Canada actually, but uh, I, <laughs> you know, I'm I am Canadian, so I I, I grew up here. Um, is Canadian is Canada better? What I notice about the U.S. is that you have a lot more extremes and a lot more confrontation. Canadians are a bit more mild, and and it's a little bit more. I find that you don't have quite the same levels of of that discourse, and also the uh, the polarization is not as strong. It's getting stronger. I'm seeing it absolutely grow quite a bit, but in the U S it's, it's really wild to me how, how much of that there is. And it wasn't the case for, for a long time in the U S either, but it's really escalated quite a bit. And it's not like it's based on nothing. I mean, certain groups are very unhappy with how they're being treated or ignored and that's not being tackled properly. And so they get more dis- discontent, more ignored. And so they tend to lash out and it causes division. And 
And that's what I'm seeing more of in Canada, as well as, you know, obviously it's quite a bit of that in the U.S. Hey, all, if you know me, you know I'm not that handy in the kitchen, and I have become a huge believer and booster of Factor. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating a joy. It's so fast, you just pop that thing two minutes later, and you are eating a restaurant-quality, healthy meal, making you feel excellent about yourself. My favorite is the turkey chili with zucchini, and there is so much more to choose from. You never get tired of it. It fits any budget. It's fast, healthy. It is going to be the new factor in your life. Yes, I'm a fan. Head to factormeals.com slash yang50 and use code yang50 to get 50% off your first box and two free wellness shots per box while subscription is active. That's code yang50 at factormeals.com slash yang50 to get 50% off your first box. Get Factor today. It's going to change the way you eat. Yeah, a Canadian friend joked that it's like living in the apartment above the meth lab. And uh, unfortunately, I think uh, some of the, the fumes might get up to you guys. Catherine, congratulations on sharing what it's a very important personal story. It's a story that uh, others, if they don't experience directly, they certainly feel affected by maybe because they're fearful. Um, you have some very concrete lessons as to how to venture out a little bit, uh, find your tribe, um, make sure that you have a means of supporting yourself <laughs> if you yes. decide to go out, go out on, um, uh, on certain limbs. Um, but finding other people like yourselves, the stories were compelling, very human, very humanizing. And uh, I, I feel like so many people feel and believe the exact same way that you do in this book and just hope that they don't experience anything like what you experienced. But then uh, you're proof that someone can come through it stronger, uh, wiser, uh, with a different tribe, uh, with a different mission. Uh, the book is No Apologies, How to Find and Free Your Voice in the Age of Outrage, Lessons for the Silenced Majority, which unfortunately really does include most of us. Aside from the book, how can people keep up with you and your work, Catherine? Sure. Well, I write little essays on my Substack, and um, you can find it through going to katherinewrites.com or randomminds.substack.com. And so it's it's all, some of it is about society and free, freedom of speech. And sometimes I talk about, uh, I have an essay about, you know, talking to imaginary friends. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a little bit, you know, all over the place, true to the name Random Minds. And then I have um, also, um, I'm pretty active on my my social media account, which is on X, formerly known as Twitter. I feel like you have to include that part. And my username there is Mysterious Cat, K A T. Well, Cat, you can tell, is an extraordinary thinker and writer and human being. Uh, congratulations on the book. Uh, it's a great achievement. And thank you for not taking it lying down. You know, like, like you see the wrong, you want to try and make it better. And you are expressing what. The, the silenced majority truly is thinking and feeling. I hope so. And I really hope, you know, the reason I wrote this book is I really wanted to empower the silent majority. I think most people are actually sensible, but it takes, you know, a few really radical voices to set the narrative of our world and our society. If you look through history, it wasn't like a lot of people trying to start revolutions or, or genocides and all of that. It's, it's a small group of people, but then a large group of people who may have disagreed with it, but remain silent because they're afraid. And look, I did come out of the other way. I, I am happy that I made the choices that I did because I feel like I am a stronger person. I have more genuine, better friendships. I have a voice that I've unlocked within myself. I feel as a human being, I think it has been a really positive experience. So started with a very, very negative experience, but you know, it doesn't mean 
that things won't get difficult. You know, it has changed my world. It's certainly changed my occupational side of things for me, where I stand, where I fit, because I don't really fit anywhere. And it's most difficult, I think, when you don't fit anywhere. But ultimately, I think we do have a responsibility and each of us has to decide for themselves whether to speak up if they believe something is important enough to speak up. And it doesn't have to be You know, it doesn't have to be like going up on a public stage and and making a big fuss. Sometimes it's just small enough where you're just supporting a friend, you know, standing up when somebody's bullying somebody else, just sending somebody a note of reassurance. You find different ways and you figure out, you know, what means the most to you. And are you okay with life being, you know, where you have to not be yourself with everyone around you. Are you okay with that? And what is the cost of that? What is the cost to society when it comes to that? If we're afraid to explore things, we never get to refine them. We never get to refine our own thinking. We don't get to express, you know, art is a very powerful thing. And there's so much censorship, self-censorship in particular within art. You, and, and that's where we really have discourse. Academia is meant to be the place where ideas meet in class and fight it out and change and morph. That's not happening. Same with science, where, you know, that's the whole point of the scientific method is is a disagreement of ideas and testing things out. When that's not happening, you know, what kind of society do we live in? And is that, and so you have to ask yourself, is that the society that you want? And do you want those very angry bully type people to be the ones running things and telling you what society should look like and what are the consequences of that? So that's why I believe in speaking. And even though the title of my book is No Apologies, I very much believe in taking responsibility for things that you do or say if if you're wrong. But if you're not wrong, you cannot allow people to just dictate, you know, what you should or shouldn't say. Well, uh, that's a fantastic note to end on. Catherine, congratulations for championing humanity uh, and for a book that I enjoyed a great deal. Um, looking forward to hopefully growing a tribe. You do belong, Catherine, really. And, and it's clear you're thriving, <laughs> you. but um, but uh, it, it's a, a pleasure to be able to make common cause and hopefully build a movement around people who want the things that you're describing. I absolutely love that. I have to say, like the people that I've interacted with who are in your tribe or the forward movement um, have always been far more open minded and thoughtful individuals. Yes. So I, I like what I see. Yeah, I've, I've been very impressed. I've only had positive experiences. So when I see that blue cap on people's Twitter accounts, it's like, oh, I think I'm going to have a good conversation with that person. So I yeah. really appreciate you having me. And I'm really glad we had a chance to actually connect and talk. And I love that you enjoyed my book. Um, I'm I'm so glad our people actually give off that vibe. That that makes me happy and proud. Um, but yeah, me too. Uh, you know, I feel like uh, you and I have been connected online, and but this is our first sit down convo. Hopefully, not the last. Hopefully, not the last. Thanks so much for having me. 